Hello and welcome to your Glassnode video report for the week on chain week 32. I'm your host Checkmate and we're recording this on the 10th of August 2021. So this week we're really following the market rally that we've seen off the bottom. We've seen continued strength as the market rallies up and actually gets above the 200 day moving average this week. And what we're really going to look at this week is what the spending behavior is across the different cohorts, what's the hodling behavior looking like, and what is the probability of a supply squeeze when we combine all of these metrics together. So what we'll look at today is the magnitude of old hands that are spending coins and just looking at what some of those longer term investors are actually doing, whether they're taking exit liquidity into this market strength or hanging on to their coins. We'll do a bit of a combined analysis that uses lifespan metrics and volume metrics to understand exactly who and where are moving those coins and what's the overall view from that. We'll look at some of the dynamics between long and short term holders and what their supply dynamics are telling us about the hodling behavior and the aggregate sentiment in the market. And we'll also assess the probabilities of a supply squeeze, which is a narrative that's been talked about quite a bit in the market. And we'll just have a look at some of the metrics that tell us whether there is or there is not a supply squeeze in play and what are some of the things we can pay attention to to really gauge what the probability of something like this happening actually is. So let's jump across into Glassnode Studio and we'll get started with this week's analysis. So here we are in Glassnode Studio. We're looking at our week on chain 32 dashboard. And we can see that for this week in particular, both BTC and ETH have had very, very strong weeks. We've really continued this rally off the, uh, the local lows in the consolidation period. We're seeing a lot of the sentiment shifting on chain. We're seeing people starting to realize profits and the market is able to absorb those profits and continue to trend higher, which is a positive sign. So to start off our analysis, we're going to look at a metric called the SOPR or the spent output profit ratio. And we have two different variants of this. The first one is called adjusted SOPR, which filters out only for coins that are older than one hour. So normally when a coin is moved and then moved within the next hour, it's normally what we call a relay transaction. It was sent to an address and that was an intermediate location that then got sent again. So what we do is we discount those coins that really don't represent economic activity. We remove those ones that are just relay transactions. So it provides us a cleaner picture than the standard uh, SOPR metric. And we have a short-term holder SOPR, which then filters for only the transactions held by short-term holders. So a very high level on what the SOPR metric is. And for full details, I would certainly recommend you look at Glassnode Academy. We have a full suite uh, across all of the SOPR variants that really describes how they're used in the different cases. But at a very high level, SOPR will trend higher when more profits are realized. Now, when more profits are being realized on chain and prices rallying higher, it means that the market is able to absorb those profits. People are spending their coins into market strength, taking their profits, and the market continues to trend higher, showing that there's demand and enough to absorb those coins. What we saw in the uh, first phase of Q1 is we saw this uh, a rally higher in SOPR as more and more profits were taken. The same was prevalent across both the adjusted SOPA, so the whole market, and the short-term holder SOPA. So everybody was realizing profits. As we moved past January, February, we started to get declining profits being realized. And this is what started to form this topping pattern. We, we started forming this almost sideways consolidation period as more and more profits are realized, showing that the market was struggling to absorb those profits overall. Following our sell-off in May, we actually fell down and traded below a value of one. Now, when SOPA trades below a value of one, we, what this means is that on net, the market is realizing losses. So coins that are being spent are disproportionately those that were purchased at a previous, uh, at a higher price. So folks who are buying coins at the $50,000, $60,000 range were then spending their coins down in the $30,000, $40,000 range. So it's realizing a net loss. And what's important to note is that our short-term holder SOPA was particularly negative and actually more negative than our adjusted SOPA. So remember that adjusted is the entire market. Short-term holder is coins that are roughly younger than about five months. So it's showing that within that, that short-term uh, holder cohort, they were predominantly realizing losses and any of the profits that were realized by longer-term holders who had coins from much, much, uh, from an older period were being offset, we weren't able to offset the, uh, the losses by those short-term holders. Now, as it relates to this current week, let's zoom into three months on both of these charts. What's key is we come out of a period of sustained bearish price action. So we're seeing SOPA trading below one for an extended period of time. The market is realizing losses. It's a painful period across the board. 
Now, what we've seen is the market break higher above a value of one, which means that we saw profits being realized and the price continued to rally, which showed that the market was absorbing those sell, that sell side. And then we have what's called a SOPA reset, where we actually saw the SOPA metric pull back down to, to one or very close to one on both the adjusted SOPA and the short-term holder SOPA. Now, when SOPA goes to a value of one, it's mean that on net, all of the profits and losses realized are essentially at the break even. Now, think about this from a profitable coin holder perspective. If you are spending your coins at cost basis, or there's enough people spending profitable coins, which matches the loss making coins, SOPA would trend much higher if people were exiting with their, you know, coins they bought at $3,000 or $6,000, very long term holders. If they were selling, we would see both of these metrics trending much higher. It means that much larger profits are being realized. This is not what's happening. So a reset back down to a value of one shows that conviction to hold remains. People are not spending their profitable coins. They're actually hanging on to them. So a SOPA reset back down to one actually shows that conviction has returned to the market and people holding profitable coins have stopped spending. And also those with loss making coins also don't necessarily want to spend. Otherwise we would trend lower. And then we had a bounce higher. So it's really this reset back down of conviction and it aligns with where uh, the price actually formed a bottoming dip and then rallied from there. And that's again showing that price is absorbing that sell side demand, that sell side pressure, and the demand is sufficient to keep trending higher. So it's actually a very positive sign. And really what we'd like to see from the SOPA for sustained upwards action is for SOPA to trend higher alongside price, showing that the market can absorb that sell side. And um, SOPA resets, particularly during dips, tend to show that conviction has returned. Now, the bearish case would be if SOPA metrics fell back below a value of one and then actually stayed there. That would show that losses are now being realized again. And overall, it means that the market is not able to absorb the, that sell side pressure. So that's the kind of two binary sides that it's worth paying attention to as the market moves on. So next, we're going to look at a combination of spent output age bands and we're also going to look at a number of lifespan metrics, namely average coin dormancy and ASOL. And we have two different variants here, the entity adjusted and the standard ASOL metric. So at a very high level, average coin dormancy looks at the total amount of lifespan. So the older a coin is, the longer it's remained dormant, the more coin days it has accumulated. Now, when that coin is spent, we look at all of the lifespan that is spent and destroyed. So all of the coins that are moved on that particular day, they destroy the lifespan that they have accumulated. We sum all of that together into our total coin days destroyed. And then we divide that by the total BTC volume that was spent that day. And that gives us a per day spent, uh, uh, the amount of lifespan or days that were spent per BTC that was moved. So it gives us a normalized metric. Whereas the ASOL metric looks at only the age of the UTXOs that were spent. So it doesn't care about the BTC volume that was spent. It just cares about the age of the outputs or the age of the UTXOs that were spent on that particular day. So they're two different versions of a lifespan metric. And what we're really looking for is uptrends as we saw during the late stage of 2020 and Q1. Uptrends in all of these lifespan metrics means that older coins are on the move. Long-term holders are realizing profits. Conversely, when we have a downtrend in these metrics, what we're seeing is that conviction to HODL remains. They're not spending those older coins and the day-to-day -day traffic, which is disproportionately younger coins, that's the, dominating the overall network value. So what we're really seeing here is a continued downtrend on both ASOL, on both versions, the standard version and the entity adjuster, which is a slightly cleaner signal, and on dormancy, we're seeing a continued downtrend of all of these lifespan metrics. And what that's really telling us is that the average age of coins that are being spent is fairly young, and that means that older coins are remaining fairly dormant. So that's the takeaway from this. Older coins are remaining relatively dormant, and most of the coins that are on the move at the moment are day-to-day -day young coin traffic, which is actually fairly normal in an accumulation or, a, um, or even a bear market, because remember the bear market is just a longer term accumulation. But generally when we're seeing those older coins remaining dormant, which is showing that conviction to hold remains in the market. And we can actually see this in our spent output age bands. If we zoom into this last couple of months, what we can actually see is that we saw a slight spike in these older coins. These are multi-year up to multi-month long um, old coins. 
particularly during the May sell-off, we saw a slight uptick. It started to really smooth down, and particularly these year-old coins, we're seeing a swelling up of these warmer yellow bands, which are the, the one hour, the one day, the one weekly bands. We're seeing a larger proportion of those being spent and a reducing proportion of the older coins being spent. So that's, again, confirming what we're seeing in our lifespan metrics, that on aggregate, most of the coins that are on the move tend to be younger, and most of the older coins are staying stationary. So that's a takeaway from this lifespan and age bracket uh, analysis. So now we can jump to this metric, which is looking at, so that was looking at the age of the coins that were on the move. Now we're looking at the dollar value or the dominance between zero and 100%. What proportion of the total spending or transactions were of a particular dollar size? Now at the top here, we have our reds, oranges, and yellows, which is demonstrating our up to $1,000, 1000 to 10000 10000 to 100000 So on a relative scale, smaller size transactions. And in terms of our darker green colors, we're talking about $10 million down here in this turquoise color. And then in green, we're talking about 1 million to 10 million. So larger size institutional grade type transactions. Now note that since October or November 2020, we've seen a fairly strong uptrend in these green colors. And that's showing that a larger proportion of the transaction volume on chain has been dominated by 1 million to 10 million plus transaction sizes. Now, this is actually quite significant. It's risen from an, a total between these, so $1 million plus from October in 2020 all the way up until the peak here is rising from a 30% dominance to about a 70% dominance. And as a result of that, these smaller transactions are representing a significantly smaller portion of the transaction volume. So it's really demonstrating that there's been a change or a fairly substantial shift in the amount of dollar value that's flowing through the Bitcoin network, and it is largely becoming institutional size. We're seeing 1 million up to 10 million plus size transactions that are moving through the network. Now, the other thing to note is that during our current price rally, we've actually seen an increase, a further increase in the dominance, particularly of this $10 million plus zone. And because we've taken our lifespan analysis from up here and noted that most of the coins that are on the move are fairly young, when we correlate those fairly young coins with an increasing dominance of large transaction sizes, it's actually telling us that we have mostly younger coins of a larger size. And in general, if we've got long-term holders who are accumulating you know, $10 million, $20 million, and they're putting it into cold storage, when they spend those coins, our lifespan metrics will actually trend higher. So what we can deduce from this is there's a higher probability that these coins, these $10 million, $1 million transaction sizes, are likely to be more accumulation than sell side. What we're seeing is that if they were sell side, they're likely to have been held for some period of time and our lifespan metrics would tick higher. We're not seeing that, and therefore we would deduce that it's more likely that they are going to be new coins that are accumulated in larger size. And it does correlate with outflows coming from some of our larger exchanges. So there's a few pieces of evidence there that we can build a case that it's more likely to be an accumulation style behavior than a net spending behavior. Now, what we can also look at are our hodl waves and our long and short-term holder supply. And what we're really trying to assess here is what is the probability of a supply squeeze occurring on chain? Now, what we're actually going to do is jump into a Glassnode Workbench, which is a new feature that's been recently released, and really explore this problem in a little bit more detail. So here we are in Glassnode Workbench, and we've constructed a metric here called long and short term supply. Now, what we're looking at with this metric is a number of things. We have our price chart to give us a representation of where we are in time. We've got our circulating supply in this dark orange color, so that's the total BTC supply. We've got our adjusted supply, which accounts for coins that we assume to be lost or coins that are very ancient and we believe could be lost or at least economically unimportant at this point. We have our long-term holder supply in blue. And again, these are coins that are roughly older than five months. It shows those coins that have been dormant for a long time and are less likely to be spent. And then we have our short-term holder supply, which we can see tends to oscillate in the reverse direction to our long-term holder supply. And that represents the other side of the equation. They're coins that have recently moved within the last five months, and they're the most statistically likely to be re-spent in the future. 
Now, just as a very high level on how to interpret this chart, what we see, particularly during bearish markets, we can look at the 2014-15 bear market as an example, we see rising long-term hold of supply as accumulation takes hold. This corresponds to a reduction in short-term hold of supply, showing that more people are accumulating coins and putting them into cold storage, and all of those young coins are being sucked out of exchanges, put into the cold storage and starting to mature. So we see a reduction in short-term, a rise in long-term, until eventually we reach a point of a supply squeeze, which is where we get this peak in long-term hold of supply. They then start distributing and spending their coins as price rallies in a bull market. Long-term holders sell their coins and distribute. They become short-term holder coins until we hit a point of saturation where the market cannot absorb anymore and the cycle repeats. We start to form this topping pattern. We return into a bear market and long-term holders start accumulating. Short-term holders start dropping off the network and those coins start maturing. So now in our recent series, we can actually see the same. Following the 2018 through 19 to 20 bear market, we reached this point of a supply squeeze where we had a maximum node of long-term holder supply, a minimum of short-term holder supply, and then we saw the same distributive behavior. We formed a topping pattern, and what we're now seeing is that that supply is starting to climb back up again. So again, it's starting to look similar to what would otherwise look like a previous bear market, we are seeing that accumulation style behavior. Now, what's interesting is that we've actually come up, note how the distribution and then the recovery of our long-term holder supply took from January 2017 almost all the way through to January 2019. So it took two full years for this process to complete. Now in our current market environment, up here at about 12.5 million coins was our peak hodl zone. We've had our distribution and note the pace, the speed at which our long-term holder supply is actually climbing up and getting almost to the same point as our supply squeeze zone. So what we're actually seeing is that the volume of coins that were accumulated in this early bull market, a large proportion of them remain unspent and we're actually starting to approach the zone where the argument for a supply squeeze starts to become a little bit more amenable. We start seeing that there's actually credence behind that notion. We're seeing that the recovery of this supply curve is actually much, much faster than what we've seen in the past. And what this is really demonstrating is that there's a number of people, a very, very large uh, portion of the supply that was accumulated in the early bull market from late 2020 right through to January, February, March in 2021, a large proportion of that supply remains unspent and held in cold storage. So this is really showing a very, very rapid recovery and we're actually not far off this 12.5, 12 12.6 million coins. We're currently here at about 12.48 million. So we're getting very close to that node. Now, again, just a word of caution, just note that previous instances, it did take some time. Long-term holder supply tends to plateau. This is really what a bear market tends to look like, where we have this tossing between the bears and the bulls. But it is important to note how quickly this recovery has come in. So the performance of this over the next couple of weeks and months will really tell us an indication of how much that supply was held and whether we do start to see a supply squeeze coming in to support this rally higher. So thanks again for tuning in. Make sure to give us a like and a share on, uh, on YouTube. We really appreciate your viewing time and I look forward to seeing you next week. Cheers.